work which way. We are apparently live. I usually check um, in the group. So I'm just going to quickly check because I never trust technology. If anyone's there, please say hello and let us know. Good evening, you're Good evening all. Because yeah. what all the Anthea says, well, my, people have um, liked my earlier. Yes, we are there. Yay. Okay. Oh, now. Oh, wait, we are. Okay, before now, I'm just going to quickly, before we welcome Ali, we've got a quick bit of housekeeping. I've got six people watching now. Hello. Hi, Tracy. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to be really rude not to hello to everyone quickly because I've got a, you may have seen the message in the group. Um, unfortunately, Facebook and StreamYard are having a bit of a fight. And so <laughs> sometimes it's not live streaming for a long time and it cuts off like it did last weekend when Anthea and I were trying to talk about Ali's. Oh, wonderful book. So um, if it does that, we are going to stop and we'll pre-record and we'll post. So apologies, it won't be live. Um, but hopefully it doesn't. Just a quick reminder, if you want to us to see your name like this, hi Anne, then you hi. must go to streamyard.com slash Facebook and approve this. Uh, otherwise, it's going, you're going to appear like this. Hello, That's whoever awesome. you are. <laughs> and mysteriously, we don't know who you are. Here he is. So, so I'm not feeling very well tonight, so I'm going to hand over Anthea to run the show and tell us about Ali's oh fantastic book. Oh, my God. Book. What a Best terrible job. disaster. Hi, everybody. I'm putting my glasses on. If you're handing over responsibility, <laughs> I'm putting my glasses so I actually know what's going on. I wanted to say welcome to Ali Sinclair, the marvellous author of The Code Breakers, which I've loved. Um, I grew up on period dramas and the ABC, so this is right up my alley. I love any form of historical, any form of period drama, and I love Second World War yes. um, novels. So I just soaked this up and loved it. Also, I live in Brisbane, so I doubly, triply, quadruply loved reading this book. Um, <laughs> I, I know that most of the people who are watching this will have read the book, so we're not too worried about spoilers. And there's oh, yeah. lots of specific things I want to ask you, Ali, about little anecdotes that are in here that I'm I'm wondering if you've made up or if you've had conversations with ladies who've told you goss. Ah, so I'll okay. Do that later. But what I first <laughs> want to ask you is why did you write it? What was your inspiration? Wow. Um, I... Yeah, sorry, can I just interrupt? Because, yep. yes, there will be spoilers. I'm just putting this up there. Yeah. Well, there might not be, but we don't guarantee that there won't be. Because, <laughs> oh, um, so, yes. So we can have a deep chat about the book. So if you don't like spoilers, then uh, stop now. Come back after you've read the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so I've written a book in 2018 called Burning Fields. And it was set in 1948 in Australia. And my main character, Rosie, had worked for the Australian Women Army Service in Brisbane in World War II. And so I thought, oh, you know what, I wouldn't actually mind finding out a little bit more about wartime Brisbane, you know, maybe as an idea for a new book. So I Googled World War II, Brisbane, women, Australian Women's Army Service, and this, like, really tiny article popped up about this female co-breaker in Brisbane. And I'm like, what? I didn't even know we had co-breakers. So, know. yeah, so that was that was really the start of everything. And uh, it, it took me a lot of research, um, a lot of uncovering and a lot of dead ends um, to finally find out more about these female co-breakers. It took me about six months to track them down and, um, and have these conversations with them. Um, but, yeah, that was one tiny little obscure article from a few years ago was really the catalyst for the whole the whole book you must have wow. just been so excited when you found it because it's like oh, gold yeah. to find something like that as an author oh yeah absolutely i couldn't believe someone hadn't written about them before so i thought okay well no one else has so i'm definitely doing this Grab them. <laughs> absolutely now who now because yeah. i'm aware that you have, have met at least one maybe two of the co-breakers can you tell us about how that came about what it was like to yeah. meet them and what's what yeah. how did that all work how did that happen Oh, uh, look, I, I think a lot of it was the stars aligning as well um, and also me being really pig-headed and I wasn't going to, you know, leave any stone unturned until I finally got to meet one, at least one of them. So you I went a really <laughs> Pardon? You could have been a detective maybe in your... Yeah. <laughs> I think I should have. I really think so. Um, but uh, I read a book called The Secret Code Breakers of Australia. 
was, uh, something like that. Um, and I, I really loved it. It was a non-fiction book, but they only had really funny bits about the women, but I knew that this author had spoken to them. So I emailed him and um, told him I was writing a book and I really wanted to track down these women. So we had a few conversations over the phone. Obviously, he was betting me to make sure I wasn't too crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> once you he got over... Yeah. We're all crazy. Yeah. Oh, you need yeah. to be just well, the right, right amount of crazy. Yeah. 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 That's right. Um, so then he said, all right, well, I, I will call a couple of the co-breakers and, and see if they are happy to um, talk with you. And he did. And they said yes. And one of them lives a couple of hours away from me. Another one, she's quite a, quite a distance, but we, you know, phone's great. And they're like 96 and 98 years old. They're just amazing. Uh, so, yeah. yeah and, and I've spoke, well, we've become friends now. But um, so for the last two years, they've just been an amazing <laughs> resource um yeah so, so in terms um, of them keeping the secret ally when yeah. were they first able or willing to speak about it yeah um 2009 they um so bletchley park in the uk which is sort of was kind of their really big headquarters um, they got a letter from the Prime Minister and also a, a certificate and a medal of recognition from Bletchley Park. And so then they kind of knew the cat was out of the bag and they so could sort of... It was up till then, because we saw that in the book, which I thought was just gorgeous, but it yeah. wasn't yeah. up till then they'd even told their families. Had these girls been telling their families or anyone at all? That no, never mentioned no one. No one at all. Oh, I'm yeah. going to jump in and ask you a quick question going off schedule. We were just watching <laughs> on the weekend whether you could keep, well, we, we could keep a secret. Now, I, Anthea probably could. I couldn't. We said it's not because I'm bad at keeping secrets it's I'm bad at lying. That makes me sound better. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> you think that's good? You're going to lie. The secret, <laughs> no, I, I think, well, I, you know what? Little secrets, not so good, but the big, really important <laughs> stuff, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I could. Can you keep it? Yeah. yeah. I just yeah. want to say before Amy um, got that yes, what and Anthea said, I love the ending and how Oh, thank you. The word, fortuitous or no, anyway, that, that actually really happened in a way. Well not not obviously bits of your you know, the, but you did lovely, see that that had yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Because you know, as an author we're often, you know, searching for that perfect prologue or that perfect ending and yeah. it just seemed perfect. I'm yeah. all, so I, I wanna ask That's you more great. about the, the secrets in a minute. Um, yeah. Talk to talk to you about Flory, but before then, can I ask you about when you're writing period? And so you've got you've gone back to 1945 or 44, 43. How is that changing your writing voice? And is that a, a, a conscious thing you're doing, or are you just getting into the zone and, and it's naturally happening? How are you coping with that? Yeah, I, I think because I have written a lot of historical storylines in the past, mm. um, and, and they've been dual storylines, so I've had to switch switch between like contemporary and also historical um, I think I've just kind of trained myself to just get myself in into the zone um, and because it's a lot of the stories I've written have been like the 40s the 50s the 60s the vernacular is kind of quite similar it's different yeah. than if I was writing say 1850s that that would be different but I'm used to writing in those eras so it does kind of come naturally but then I also have a really great editor who will then pick me up on anything that she might say oh you know what that sounds a bit too too modern so yeah yeah because I feel like actually in novels you can pick it you know, oh hang on were we saying that at that point I'm not sure if we were yeah so yeah but that's what yeah, that's yeah, why Google's to... really great for that yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely now, yeah. did you, when you were writing your characters, and I and I know that you were speaking to some of the girls who actually were the co-breakers, did you infuse any of their stories or any of their experiences? Oh, yeah, into uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. Like, um, I, I mean, as, as you, you ladies know, that it's really uncommon to have a character that arrives on the page fully formed, right? Usually it takes us a while to get to know them and, and learn a lot about them. But Ellie really... Yeah, she did. She, I, I knew exactly who she was and what she was about from the minute I kind of opened up the Word so document. Did she come before the ladies? Like, did you have her before no. the ladies yeah. or after the ladies? Okay. After. So I had, like, I had an idea of her story, but who the essence of her, I think, um, really came about from the conversations that I had from these ladies because 
there were a lot of commonalities like a lot of them were you know young women from the country they were they um you know really respectable families um they you know were living in brisbane and independent for the first time and they were just um yeah i mean they're very obviously very smart women um but there were just quite a few elements that they that they all possessed and i think that was part of the recruitment process they were looking for certain qualities in their personalities and so yeah so ellie is kind of a culmination of all the women that i i spoke with and actually carol one of the ladies um who <laughs> she was reading it and she'd ring me up and she'd be like i reckon that scene was about me so she, <laughs> she was bringing bits out and, and all you know, all the good bits and she go oh i reckon that was me. <laughs> it wasn't but okay <laughs> Before Anthony asks another question or any, you say anything, I just want to say, Tracy, yes, I have to say, I don't know if everyone knows that Anthea's previous life, she was an ABC radio producer. So she knows yeah. her story questions and interviewing people. He does. Yeah, and, and also I, I'm very self-serving because I'm trying to get Ali to teach me how to write my next book. So I'm also asking questions. <laughs> well. But I wasn't what this is all about. <laughs> yeah, it's the Anthea show. <laughs> In terms of Ellie, though, as well, because she had this remarkable career that extended beyond the wall, mm. which surprised me because I thought you were going to end at the end of the wall. So that surprised me. Yeah. So. I thought I, I was going to had... as well. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. Now, you want uh -huh. to hear about that, A. We want to yep. hear about that. And B, we want to hear, was she based on a lady that you heard about or did you just want to give her that trajectory because you thought she bloody well deserved it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She really well deserved it. Um, it's really interesting. So I, I read. I mean, I I read a lot of historical fiction, especially set in World War Two, and um, and I absolutely love it. But this story itself, like when I started writing it, I knew it was going to be mostly Ellie's story. Um, but as I was speaking to the women and learning about their lives post war, I thought that that's just that's a really big piece of their lives, like because working for Central Bureau had such an impact for decades on their lives. And so I, I felt that I wouldn't have done the story any justice had I finished it at the end of the war because I, I because the whole story afterwards about having to keep the secrets and the effect of not feeling useful anymore, you know, they've done these important jobs and then after the war, they're expected to go into the kitchen or, you know, do menial tasks where they had been like dealing with some of the biggest secrets Australia ever had. Um, mm -hmm. So I thought that was really worth exploring as well. And it did kind of flow in, into that. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. And just in terms of the secrets and you're talking about them keeping the secrets, yes. I was very annoyed. Um, bloody Flory. <laughs> oh, Flory. <laughs> Now, Anthony was messaging me and saying, Flurry, Flurry, Flurry. Do you have an issue with Flurry? I did. She does. I have a big issue with Flurry. I think she's a terrible friend. And I think <laughs> that they could have private conversations. And I don't know why Flurry, having even met her years later, then didn't say, let's yeah. keep in touch. It's all cool. We can both get yeah. a secret, can't we? Why, was that based on you'd spoken to the girls and they said, no, I just couldn't have coped and I had to totally vacate? Or did you just want to show how seriously they took the circuit? Like, why was Flory not being her friend, being Ellie's friend? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, she was partly based on, on someone that I had spoken with. So um, this particular lady, she actually didn't work for Central Bureau, but she definitely worked in top secret work um, in signals, but just in a different area. Um, she couldn't cope with keeping the secrets. Yeah. So she actually, she was engaged and after the war said, I, I need a break. I need a break from this keeping secrets. I need to go somewhere where I can just be me and I don't have to be weighed down by this whole secrecy business. So she actually went to the UK originally for six months. She stayed six years. Oh. Her fiancé waited for her oh. and she came back. <laughs> they got married and they were married for decades. But she needed to fully pull away um, just so what? that she could. Yeah, I know. How cool is that? <laughs> but she did. She needed to pull away. Oh, no, no. Waiting for her all that time. Six no. years. Six years. Six um, years. Kim's asked a question. Can you see Kim's question on there? I think we talked um, about it. But, yeah. 
Till they're acknowledged by the... Yeah, yeah, like they actually didn't get an official letter saying it's okay to talk about it um, because a lot of the work that they did during World War II was still really relevant decades later, which is one of the reasons that they had to keep secrets. Um, so because, you know, the whole Cold War thing was going on and a lot of the signals intelligence that they had developed back in the 40s was still being used in the 50s and 60s, which is one of the mm -hmm. reasons that they extended you know that wow. that whole secrecy thing but yeah they never actually really um got an official letter unlike the epilogue <laughs> so yeah, um, that was, that was no. so they never got recognized well yeah no yeah well actually up until last year end of last year the australian government had never recognized Okay. Um, breakers at all. So in 2009, they got recognised by the UK government and they did get the Bletchley Park Medal and the certificate and letter and everything from the um, Prime the Minister. UK. Yeah, but the Australian government, it was only in the last six months or so because I, I see Coral quite often. Yeah. And, pardon? Yeah, I mean, the book was sort of written before they got recognition. Yep, yep it was. Yeah, yep. Yeah, so I'm like, oh no, spoils my book. <laughs> one of the things that I had always said was, I hate that. So I it, it, I know when real life gets in the way of fiction. Yeah, <laughs> it. it happens all the time in contemporary fiction. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's interesting. It's taken this long so now for the Aussies to recognise them. Can I just say one thing? If anyone else has any questions, because we've got those so ones from Kim and. We've got some other questions, but if anyone wants to post questions, post them. Yes, yes. Anyway, go, Anthea. Sorry. <laughs> well, I just wanted to ask about. I just wanted to ask about your research because I know that you said you saw the article, and I know that you've spoken yep. to some of the girls who were working in the area. But were you finding you? I think you said you found a book. Were you working from books, or were you going to the war memorial, or what were you doing to find out what the day-to-day -day work and that they were in the shed and all that? Where were you finding that information? Yeah, um, oh gosh, you know, it's, it's, uh, one of the best things about being an author is it opens doors that you would not normally be able to open. So I managed to track down uh, a gentleman who was the ex-head of the Australian Signals Directorate and he was a bit of a central bureau historian. Um, so the Australian Signals Directorate is the modern day version of central bureau. So it's the whole signals intelligence and the security of our, our country. And so he was just a wealth of information. And if he couldn't answer questions for me, he would send me in the right direction. So mm -hmm. I, as part of my research, I spoke to him. I also spoke to um, a couple of signal professors and historians at the University of New South Wales. And they'd send me <laughs> these like 50 page technical documents that, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, what does this mean? But I um, it up. I'd be yeah. like, no. <laughs> <laughs> But also because there's yeah quite a bit of honesty history in there as well. So um, there's an amazing gentleman Tom up at the um, up in Winton um, at uh, no Longreach, yeah the, at the Qantas building up there and um, yeah so I've, and oh also the Royal Flying Doctors Service. I spoke to them about their history and how it all, it all worked with um, their partnership with Qantas as well, you know, just after the war. And so, yes, yeah, so there was so much research in there. It was just, yeah, it nearly broke me. Did you yeah. do the research mostly before you wrote the book? I know some people research before, some people write the book and then find out what they sort of need to fill in the gaps and other people research as they go. So how did you go about that? I, everything. So I usually do a really a huge amount of research to begin with um, and then I write the book, but as I'm writing the book, um, oh, my first drafts are shocking. So I've got heaps of comments in the in the corners going, research this, research that, and I have a big list of things I need to go off and, and then research. Um, but it wasn't just like the, the people's personal stories and their experiences. I also had to tie everything in with the whole big timeline of World War II and what was going on then. So yeah. that was a whole other thing in, in itself. So, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty. I don't write that type of book. Yeah. <laughs> If you don't like research, it would, yeah, no. <laughs> I like some type of research, but not that. And timelines, that we, you, you, as soon as you said timeline, I was like, I'm out. Um, <laughs> Geraldine's got a great um, Rachel question. Rachel likes going to New Orleans research. She's big on that. Yeah, yeah. I just want oh, to yeah, know. Oh, you're good research, yeah. You're drinking, aren't you? It's not me. It's really Anthea. She's very bad influence. 
<laughs> I believe it. Um, so Geraldine said, I was sad to be finished reading the book. I enjoyed it so much. Were you sad when you finished writing? I think that's a great question. I, I was. I, I really, I miss the girls. And, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I was really sad and I've missed them quite a bit. And, um, you know, the, the, I mean, you know, you read your book so many times with your edits and all that sort of stuff, but I would still cry at the end. <laughs> Even well, though I knew what was happening. I'm crying at the end too, but I'm not crying about what's in the oh, book. I'm crying bad. about you know, how bad it is. <laughs> that stage. Well, yeah, thank you, drafts are like that too. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah, no, I do. I miss, I miss the girls. Yeah. Um, Anthony, do you have some questions or should I ask some any more or should I ask some of the ones that were given in the group first or what? how do you want to go? Look, look I had one. I had a romance question. Ooh, I have like one a romance, romance question I want to ask about poor old Harry. Oh, Harry. <laughs> yeah, it was a sad yeah. romance question. Um, you, you kind of, you tricked me because I, I sort of had, I obviously had Lewis in my, Lewis in my sights and then uh, Harry came along and then I thought, okay, now we're done and dusted. It's a bit too soon for me. Thanks, Ali. Um, I would like my romance <laughs> to not be resolved just this year. And then you got rid of poor bloody Harry. Um, what? Did you plan to or did you just go, oh, she's got to be I'm getting rid of Harry? I really liked the idea that, even though I felt very sorry for Harry, I really liked the idea that he was unable to cope with what he'd seen and yeah. he was unable to return. Yeah. Can you talk more about that? How did that pan out for you? And, and is it based on what you've been reading or heard about? Like, just tell us about that. Yeah, I think, oh, I mean, yeah, I'm really fascinated with World War Two and, you know, what happened on our shores. So it's something I've always, you know, read about and, you know, watch documentaries on and um, talk to people about. So um, I think it was really important to shed the light on, well, they didn't call it PTSD then, but mm. it, it was a it was a really big part of people's lives, um, especially for the men who, who uh, returned or, or chose not to return. Yeah. And so um, I didn't. I, yeah, I, I, I think I always knew that, that she would end up with Lewis. Um, Harry just happened along, I think, on a first draft. And I'm like, okay, well, you can stay here and let's see what happens. Um, but then the more I got to know him and his situation, I thought, actually, this is a really important thread to mm -hmm. keep in there because I think it brings more authenticity to the story. Okay. Although... Uh, Someone at my publisher suggested that I actually kill Harry off and I thought, no, I don't want him to die in a plane crash. I actually I want to make him suffer. <laughs> I think Poor much Harry. I'm glad you didn't kill him off because also yeah. I feel like that's a thing. Yes, it happened lots, probably, but I feel like in, not that I read a huge amount of historical wartime fiction, but of course people are expecting someone's going to die and people are going to lose their loves and all that. So I feel like that's the obvious thing to do and yeah. I'm glad you didn't do that. Oh, good. Um, I've got a question though because that you're talking about that. Yeah. Are you then, and I know I believe there's a spectrum and we've talked about this before, plotter or pantser? Where on the spectrum do you fit? Uh, I am definitely a plotter but I will pants as I write. I was guessing, because obviously Harry, you know, seemed to be something maybe you didn't think about in that first plotting stage. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. don't know. I actually have to go back. Oh, this book's been with me for so long. I can't remember if I... I don't know what I did with him in the first draft. He was in the first draft. Yeah. Oh, look, my synopsis. But, um, yeah, I tend to use my um, my outline as my bones and then as I write the story, if the characters take me in a certain direction or if I re I'm researching and I discover something else and feel that that's going to be better for the story, then I allow myself to do that. And I've still sort of got that outline there that I can always go back to if I write myself into a corner. Um, which I have done, like in Burning Fields, I ended up having to delete 30,000 words. I feel you that recently. I went, yeah. <laughs> I went so far off my outline and I learned my lesson after that. I'm like, yeah, no, I, I, I'm yeah. not a good person. <laughs> but I think that's the thing, isn't it? That, that's why, I mean, I don't think anyone's completely a plotter <laughs> and anyone's completely a, a pantser because, yeah. you know, it's... it's yeah, somewhere in between. I like Nola yeah. said, did you work with the oh, Australian yeah. Museum in Canberra at all for the World War II details? I think you may have mentioned that. But have you? Yes, yeah, yeah, I have. Um, yeah, I, it's just, it's been, 
the amount of me, the amount of people who've helped me with the research has just been absolutely phenomenal. I mean, you know, I guess you read at the back of the book. There's like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Like for all these people, it's just been amazing. Yeah, well, that's cool. Andy, have you got any other questions? Quiet. No, I'm quite happy if you want to go to um, listener the ones from the group. Questions. Okay, so we ask, we, we start to ask a question at the end of our 10 questions on Saturday or Sunday when we do our thing. What was the one question you would ask the author if you could? And then if we <laughs> have to have you here, we've got some. So, Kathy, I don't know if Kathy's here tonight. Um, she asks, or she's it's it's kind of a comment. I would have loved to have been with Ali when she took. I'm looking off this way because I'm reading. So if anyone's wondering why I'm yeah. saying. Um, I would have loved to have been with Ali when she toured, I'm going to say this wrong, Nairambla, is that how you yeah, say Yeah, you it? got it. Huh? Nailed it. Okay. That would have been so surreal if those wards could talk, imagine. So, I mean, it's not exactly a question, but have you got anything about yeah. that? Right? Yeah, well, that was another aspect of research which literally opened sales, doors for me. Pardon? It went up um, the sale, you said. Did it, it go up the sale resources? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, it did. I know. I haven't won that slider yet. If I did, I'd totally yes. turn it into my breaking museum. Oh, it'd be amazing. But yeah, so as part of my research, um, I mean, the, the address was well known, you know, in the last five, 10 years. And uh, so I just wrote them a letter and I was in Brisbane and I asked them nicely if they'd let me come and have a look. And they kindly said, the owners kindly said, yep, of course, no problems. And so they showed me around and it was just so surreal to be able to walk in the footsteps of these real life people um, and to walk around the, the grounds and, and go inside and actually stand in the garage where they worked. So the old garage has been pulled down and they've built a new one, but the footprint is exactly the same as to where it was um, in relation to the mansion where the men worked. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I could feel it. Like it was just so good and I'd already I'd already written my first draft by that stage so I had a good sense of the story so when I then went to do the second draft it was so much easier and I could sort of build in those the details and the feelings of of what it would have been like for them but it, yeah it was amazing it was magical that's awesome um Jessie says what was the most difficult or complex aspect of writing the code breakers understanding the technical stuff oh my god <laughs> Probably that would have been when I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so hard. Um, so in it, when the first draft, I had to just go off manuals and information that I've been given from experts because as far as I'm aware, and I've done a lot of research, there were no Typex, there are no existing Typex machines in Australia that the, like, that the women worked on. So I had to kind of go off photos and talking to people who sort of knew about them. And then it wasn't when, until I went to um, Bletchley Park in the UK and they actually had a, a, quite a few Type X machines. So I actually got to like spend time with an expert and he could walk me through the whole thing and point everything out, and which was fantastic because before then I, yeah, I, I was struggling <laughs> to understand yeah, it. Yeah, I can imagine. As I said, that would have scared me. Um, yeah. I'd be worried about explaining it wrong or something. Yeah, um, oh, yeah, petrified. <laughs> Yeah. Carolyn yeah. said, um, was and, and I know Anthea and I wanted to ask you this too. Um, was the proposal, I think we all loved the proposal over the how you say through the messages codes. Yeah, um, yeah. was that based oh, on a yes, real proposal did. or did you make that up? Based on Coral the Code Breaker. Oh. Uh, that's a great name. Yes, based on a real name. Yeah. So she, your husband that did it. Yeah, so um, that lovely relationship is actually based on Cor real life, Coral and Sandy. So Coral met Sandy at the Central Bureau. They went out on a couple of dates and then he then got shipped out to the Philippines. And so they realised that they could send little coded messages to each other with the, the padding, the filler text. Um, and, and so, yes, yeah, so they were actually able to communicate that way and so Coral and Sandy when Sandy came back from the Philippines they got married and they were married for 68 years and then he unfortunately passed away oh. in 2007 but uh, did he pass away before she could tell him what happened oh no because they were both co-breakers he was a co-breaker oh, okay. yeah. so 
They can talk about it. That was easy for them. Like they just couldn't tell their kids or their parents, but they could at least talk about it. Um, Secret that you can't tell your kids and stuff that you can. Yeah. But whenever Carol talks about Sandy, it's like she's 19, 20. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like she, yeah, she's, oh, she's back to this young 19, 20 year old and Aww. meeting for the first time. It's so beautiful. We all love it. We're all house sweet, what a beautiful story, swooning. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we've got two more questions from our wonderful members. Um Helen said, How long did it take to research this before you started writing? I think you've sort of said that you did a bit of as you were going, but yeah. Or even like from yeah, from idea to finishing the first draft. Tell us a bit about how yeah, long that I'd took. Like that. <laughs> yeah, um, oh gosh, I was probably about two years, I, I would say. Um, I did probably a good year of solid research, um, just, you know, tracking down people and finding out information um, and just letting the story form. And, yes, of course, then I had to research while I was writing the first couple of Drafts. But, yeah, it's probably about two years. So this definitely the biggest book I've written in terms of how much research I, I had to do, for yeah. sure. Awesome. Yeah. And the final question I have, so if anyone else has got questions, feel free to post them now um, and <laughs> I have some more too. What's your T-shirt, Anthea? I can't quite see it and I really love it. Is that David what? Bowie over here? Hey, David Bowie. Oh, oh that's that's it. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Wait, well, I, 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 I the hair for a second. Anyway, <laughs> okay. That's now that that's out of the way. The important, serious things have been dealt with. Um, I know. So the last question is from Geraldine, and she said, "Did you find it difficult to fit all the history um, you discovered in the book? And if so, was there much you had to leave out that you would have liked to include?" Good question. Yeah, excellent question. That's fun. um, yeah. yeah. I actually, <laughs> I. I've probably left out a good three quarters of the research that I've, you know, discovered. So we're getting code breakers too? No, <laughs> no. I don't think I have it in me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I, th I think one of the, the things is, like, you, you do all this research and you spend all this time trying to understand certain aspects, like, say, something technical, and then... You kind of like want to show off your knowledge. It's like, hey, I finally understand this. So I'm going to put this in there, and then your editor comes yeah. along and says, you know, first no more paragraphs. I reckon you could probably <laughs> condense that into two well, sentences. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Yeah. We've both been there in terms of having to condense things, and I yeah. mean, not I haven't had the same in terms of historical stuff, but I know like a couple of books. One book actually, I'm thinking. Um, one book had a missing persons element and I actually spoke to missing persons cops and they gave me so much information. And I'm like, oh, I want to put this in, I want to put this in. And there's been other, you know, books like that too. You know, you can't go too heavy on that sort of stuff because that's not the main, you know, part. But, yeah, it's it's hard. So I can imagine historical fiction will be even harder. Yeah, yeah I, and I, I think one of the secrets to writing historical fiction is actually learning what to leave out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> So has anyone got any other questions? Yeah. Anne said, never say never, Ali. She's on me with the phone. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. <laughs> yeah, I agree with this definitely. It was so easy to read. Loved it. Ah, thanks so much. Beautiful comments. Oh, here's a good question that we'll let you answer, even though Anthony and I could probably answer it as well, but it's your night. Ah. So who says, who writes the blurbs? I enjoyed the story but didn't find the discovering the spy among them very accurate. Interesting. Ah, interesting. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that was that I tussled, like, tussled yeah. the most. So, um, <clears throat> I, yeah, I usually um, write the blurb and then and then um, it then goes to my editor and um, and my publisher and then we and we and then we talk about it and then it gets bandied about marketing have a look at it sales have a like so there's a whole lot of people that look at it because they're coming at it from different angles about how I guess yeah. it relates to their department so PR will look at it and go okay from this blurb what kind of you know how will it inspire some more PR you know and yeah. um, sales will go okay how will this appeal to um booksellers you know how will how will this get their attention so there's a lot of people that are involved in it and it's the same story with covers as well it's not just you know one person's decision yeah. on, on a cover 
Um, yeah, that that funnily enough, that that spy bit, that was that was the one bit I was never one hundred percent sure about. <laughs> So, yeah. uh, I'm trying to read it. Can't see it, but the book here. But we mount my glasses yeah, and the fight in the dark. I'm not yeah, I, can't see. I haven't yeah. even got a copy handy. Would you believe it? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> you get a treasure in the midst. So. Oh, I can't see it. And he's found it. But we trust you, Sue. We trust you. We believe you, Sue. Um, but yeah. Interesting yeah, with blurbs. Like, there could be a treasure in the midst. Sometimes, I, I reckon I'm sometimes. I think our version's different. Maybe, yeah, because we have the arc, that's true, and the actual final version might be slightly different. Um, yeah, the time, though, I feel like I was talking to my publisher about blurbs. Um, I feel like writing a blurb is almost harder than writing a book. And that's oh, saying yeah. we all know how hard it is to write a book. But writing a blurb, you know, there's two things that everyone, there's important, well, three things I think that are really important in telling a book. It's the cover, definitely, the title. Yeah. But the blurb is huge. If you've managed to get them over from the cover to turn it over and the title to turn it over, if the blurb turns them off, that's yeah. your last yep. sort of chance yep. to, to, to sell a book. So, yeah. yeah. So I'm interested to say, do you, do you yeah. two write your own blurbs? Anthony, do you want to go first? Tell us about yours. Oh, she's frozen. I'm she frozen. frozen. I've contributed no, to blurbs. Um, am I frozen? No, I've contributed no, to now. blurbs and I worked it with worked it out with my um, publisher, but I've never I don't think I've ever written one and have it just turn up on the back of my book as written. No. I'm terrible at them. <laughs> it's not uh, uh, yeah, some some just I feel like it's one of those things that you either get it right straight away mm -hmm. or it's a long time of back and forth thing. Um yeah. like I've got a couple of blurbs and I've read them and I've been like so Mostly I've been lucky. My publisher starts the blurb train and she'll send me a draft. And it works different, like as I said, it depends on the publisher and editor. Everything is different. And even book to book with me. Yeah, um, yeah sure. Been and she's been like, do you want to give the blurb an attempt? And I'm like, no, not really. But I, don't say, I say, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, so we sort of have a bit of a, a back and forth and, a big comment on it and yeah some happen really quickly and then others i seem to take a long time and you're still not 100 percent happy with them but you know eventually you've got to put something on the back of the book so that's yeah. <laughs> it's very tight deadline it's like we need it by friday <laughs> it's like oh well you know yeah. like, it's interesting all of us are members of yeah. remnants writers of australia and like blurb courses and stuff through them and i i always quite like listening to people talk about what you know goes in a blurb and that one of the big things I always remember is if you can allude to secrets, secrets. Yeah. If you can put the word secret on a blurb, you're halfway there. Oh. <laughs> so true. <laughs> okay, I, I was going to ask this. Down. So here we go. What are you writing next? What's happening now for you? Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm writing a book called The Vintage Teacup Society. I love and, that title. Um, hopefully <laughs> that title is I don't drink tea. <laughs> um, but it's it's three timelines. Um, so I, I've, I've written dual timelines ah. before. But this one's three. Um, I, initially, I tried to tried to just do two, but the story definitely requires three. So it's three three different generations. Um, so yeah, and uh, look, if anyone is a mag mag keen teacup person, teapot person, I've actually got a really cool Facebook group called the Vintage Teacup Society. And people on there, yeah, it's really great. Like they post their favourite teapots and teacups and, and all the stories behind it because that's, that's the, the idea for the story basically came from, um, you know, you go to like a really cool cafe um, and, you know, they've got these teacups and they're like the vintage teacups. And it's like you're drinking out of them. It's like but what's the story? What's the story behind this particular tea set like and they all have stories to tell so i just sort of started exploring that yep so i'm doing yeah, I that love yeah. i love teapots so it's yeah one of my experience in life right. today and everyone says i oh, just drink diet coke out of it or drink milo diet coke has to be had in a specific size glass it cannot go in a teacup it just doesn't work <laughs> so anyway we all have our things <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, this is a comment. I can't say who it's from. I love the cover comment because Sorry. I just put in first impressions and can't figure out how the cover relates to the story. It must be hard having to make others make decisions about those babies. That's a really good comment because, yeah, mm. I think we all possibly have a bit of a, I'm going to leave it on there. Just, yeah, how you feel about cover decisions. Ali, do you want to start and then Anthea? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, gosh. Um, when I saw the cover for the Code Breakers, there really was basically, a, apart from a few technical aspects in terms of the, you know, the colour of her uniform and stuff, um, there wasn't really much I wanted to change because I thought that it was just captured beautifully. So I really didn't have a lot to say. But I'm also a real pain in the butt because I used to be a graphic artist and so I'm really fussy about where you know where things are on the cover and, and i'll be like oh can you just move this little bit you know a bit to the left and make this font a bit bigger and yes yeah, so i'm real pain but they they know that now they're used to me after six books <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah look covers covers are just one of those things that oh yeah i i am always nervous when when my cover you know comes through from from my publisher but you know um They've had tears, but they've always been happy tears, which is good. Um, but yeah, I mean, like my Aussie publisher, I've absolutely, I loved all my covers. Other publishers I've been with, I'm not going to name any, not love the covers at all. So you know, but but that can also be a taste thing too. Like taste different thing. It's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? Whether it is a taste thing or whether yeah. you know, I have loved pretty much all the covers that I've had in Australia, but a couple, the couple of US covers I've had, I did not love them. I thought they were pretty, but I had a gut feeling that they yeah. weren't right. And I reckon, Anthony, I've this before, I actually reckon my gut feeling about covers is pretty spot on. Same with friends, yeah. ones and different stuff. And the thing is, it can make or break your career, um, yeah. especially in the early days. Um, so I yeah. think you, know, you do have to be a bit picky and a bit fussy and say things if you don't like them. But then at the same time, it's personal taste. So you never know if it's yeah. just, you know, I mean, whenever I show a cover, say, to a group of friends, half of them initially, if it's a cover concept and I'm just sort of showing a couple of people to say, what do you think before I can make it public, half of them yeah. will be like, oh, my gosh, I love it. And the others will be like, oh, you know, I'm not really that keen on yeah. green. So it's very hard to yeah. get a cover that everyone you know is gonna love and i think the thing is often yeah. you don't know until hindsight and then yeah. whether it's worked or not and then if a book doesn't do well often the cover is blamed but you don't know if it was the cover or if it was the title or if it was or the title the you came out, or the blurb or yeah. if it was the book or there's so many different reasons um but the cover yeah. is one thing that you can sort of blame i think yeah <laughs> second yeah. is there anything to add about covers I reckon you're spot on. I know that you're very good at covers. Um, but, yeah, it is. It's that, it's that really shorthand piece of marketing that if it's not right mm. and it gives you the wrong vibe or people don't like the vibe of it, then it, it won't sell. And it and for some, because um, obviously my last two were rural, it's really hard to get a rural cover that cuts through and encapsulates what you're trying to put in the book. It's re it is actually really hard because you want it to be short. Yeah. Yeah. You want yes, well. But if you're wanting to also... Yeah. So say, but there's other stuff there too. It's hard to give that nuance in a cover. So it's a very tricky thing. So true. Yeah. I know in the early days of rural romance, a lot of us um, <coughs> authors, sorry, we would get we got really sick of the girl um, in the singlet with some sort of rural setting in the background. Um, Go on ahead. <laughs> it felt like it was the same on everyone's cover, but at the same time, there was reasons for that, and that did sell quite well. And then often when publishers tried to do something a bit different, it didn't necessarily go as well as that. So it's, it's just so complicated. Yeah, and, and it changes, yeah. right? Like the styles, styles have changes yeah. cover, yeah. like um, covers cool. change. Because like my second and third books um, are um, what you call floating head books. <laughs> I was trying to think. Hang on, see if I can grab one. Floating head. <laughs> Love it. I know what you mean. But, yeah, if you've got oh. one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's what I prepared earlier. Yeah, there's close to in rural oh, romance. Yeah. So, yeah, so, oh, God, oh. yeah, that one. So the whole floating head thing was a really big Are thing. You floating thing. head, didn't you, Anthea? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the floating heads oh, were a big I, thing. I, I was looking, 
see the, I can see your book, um, The Drifter, but I can't see the cowgirl. Is that... Now the cowgirl's got the big head, I think. Mm -hmm. the the hair and... <laughs> Maybe you didn't have a floating head then. Hang on, pass. Like, you rogue now, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> not a floating head, no. Um, and I'm pretty sure the cowgirl, you're right too. I have not had a floating head either, so you're the odd one out. No, so yeah, not. Yeah, I love that colour. Yeah, so it's not floating though, is it? It's no. no. Oh, I've got the floating heads. Do <laughs> I have a couple with floating heads? Yeah, but, so um, interesting, interesting um, thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, then sometimes it does. Oh, yes. Thanks. I have Thanks. to tell a story yes. here. So I had a cover. I'll find it. Hang on. Two seconds, people. Um, this cover. Okay, you can't see it. Outback Blaze, right? Yeah. This guy in on here at the front, obviously. And actually, I didn't love him as much as my other gun covers. Um, but other people, that was a big fight in Harlequin apparently about this one. Half oh, really? the people was a you know. So I think being on a cover meeting oh. would be really interesting. I've always loved to be a fly on the wall at a cover meeting because oh, of the public. Yeah. Because you know, basically one, it's a vote system in the end, I think it gets down to. Um, yeah. And so half the people liked him, half, you know, just over half did, no, sorry, oh. just over half liked him, just over half didn't. In the end, they went with him. And I was like, mm, he's nice, but he's not, he didn't feel like he was my person. But anyway, I don't care because, you know, in the end, I think it was a reasonably looking cover. But um, this book, we used to live in a supermarket, we used to have a supermarket, and the book, my books were always for sale there. And one lady came into the shop one day and she had bought my book and she had post-it notes all down the side, like lots of little ones. And I wasn't there, but she told my mum and our employee, oh, I read Rachel's book and I really, really loved it. Like, there's so many mistakes. Oh, no. and, and they were like, and, you know, both of you know mistakes slip through and it's frustrating and it's just part of, you know, we do our best, everyone does their best and still occasionally they come through. But... Anyway, she, my mum said, well, you know, we can give you another copy, bring the book in, because she said she's marked where all the mistakes were. And, I, and my mum said, well, she can tell the publisher and it can be fixed for future editions. So she bought it in and then I saw the book with all these, like, post-it notes coming to this right down the side and I'm like, oh, my goodness. How many oh, no. And I opened it and the majority, I think there was, like, one was, like, a comma, which was actually technically right, but, you know, there's two ways you can do commas, so she was saying it was wrong. Um, and then the other thing was that she found one more mistake in the book. But most of them were the cover. I'm, I didn't realise I mentioned his eyes this many or, or people's characters' eyes, but the colour of the eyes in the book does, apparently does not match the colour on the oh, front. Oh, no. And that was, was oh. most of the notes. So, yeah. <laughs> All these oh, my gosh. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, Absolutely. we have talked for almost 50 minutes and we have got so a little true. rogue. I hope you've enjoyed it, everyone. Ali, I mean, Ali, or Anthea first, have you got anything else to ask? She's gone again. She's yeah, No, no, I think thing. I'm very happy with that. I just want to say how much I enjoyed reading about the era and reading about Brisbane and reading and learning you in a really engaging way. It was fantastic. I just loved it. Oh, thank you. Oh. Lovely. Totally. I agree as well. Um, as I've mentioned before, I'm not a huge historical fiction. Yeah, I knew that was going to be a challenge for you, right? <laughs> no, no, I prefer Australian. If I'm going to read it, I like reading Australian historical fiction. And I like, like to me, this is, it's, yes, it's historical, but it's, I don't mind for the last century, if that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> because, yeah. you know, whereas I don't necessarily, <laughs> like, I don't hate it, but I just the fact that, you know, um, when you, your preferences when you go somewhere. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it too. I loved the proposal at the end and it was great to chat um, with everyone about it. And I think pretty much everyone in the group loved it as well. So thank you for your time and for writing the book. Everyone's saying thanks. Thanks, everyone. And, for <laughs> and yeah, so and thank you StreamYard and Facebook for actually, you know, getting us this far. It was it almost Yay. We did it. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, thank you, and thank you. you and we will see you all next month. Oh, hang on. I've actually, I wasn't even this prepared, but next month is Spring Clean for the Yay. Country. That'll so be great. A copy of Sasha's book. Um, go out and grab one, and Anthony and I will see you on the last Sunday of the month. Thank you, everyone.
Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.